Uh, let me tell you a couple of those funny stories before we get started. Uh, the the uh, Ladies, this is not an optional surgery for your husband, but the doctor was talking to Kathy Overton uh, Thursday, yeah, Thursday after the surgery, and, and it was telling her that Ivan's uh, uh, neck movement was going to be very limited. And he said he won't be able to shake his head no, but said in your favor, all he's going to be able to do is go like that. So ladies, uh, don't, don't, don't think that you can sign your husband up for that, all right? And then, then the doctor was explaining the way that he had to cut. I, I really like this guy. He was just he had a lot of personality. Uh, apparently, they made a cut like that, and then they had to go out like this. And he said, now, that's intentional. He said, it's not like we were cutting and lost our attention. He said, what's that over there? <laughs> so, so I thought that was pretty, pretty good. But anyway, uh, one more uh, kind of sick joke. Uh, the uh, our, our brother John Westbrooks had to have emergency appendectomy uh, this week, and they, they took him in and they did that. And everything's fine, of course. It's you know like drive-through surgery now almost, and and they sent him home, and he and Liz got hit by an ambulance at a stop sign, <laughs> <laughs> and it sideswiped him and it. And it Jam, I, I jam John's door so he couldn't get out on that side, and he was, you know, just had his appendectomy, so he didn't feel like crawling over the seats. So he said, "Just sit there and ate crackers till they could get him out." <laughs> so anyway, some people have had an eventful week, to say the least. If I were to ask you the question, "What is the purpose of the church? What does the church exist for?" You could have you could have several answers, and and probably pretty much all of them would be right. But if you were to condense it down into one succinct answer, the church exists to glorify God. That's, that's what we exist for. Now, there are multiple different ways that we, we can bring glory to God. Now, of course, one of them we're engaged in this morning, that is worship and praise and thanksgiving. But the one that I want to talk about today, the, the, and, I, and I plan on doing two or three of these, the one I want to talk about, a way in which we bring glory to God, is that we seek and save the lost. That is one of the reasons that we exist. We're not here uh, just because we like to dress up and come to a nice building. That's not the reason we're here. Uh, we have a purpose, and that is, is we are to worship God and learn about God, but then we're to go and share what we learn with others about God. It, it's pretty simple, and maybe we've kind of got away from stressing this as much as we once did, but in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, I'll tell you, go ahead and turn to Luke 14. We'll, I'll be there in just a second. But in Matthew 28, you know these words, in Jesus, verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority... And on earth has been given to me. In heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. We, we, now he's speaking directly to the apostles. But he's speaking indirectly to us. This is our marching orders. That we are to go and to make disciples. And then we're to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then we're to teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with Yahweh. So we go and make disciples. We baptize them. And then we teach them some more. Now that's pretty clear, folks. But our, our doing of it seems to be behind uh, rather than our understanding of it. Luke chapter 14, uh, beginning of verse 12. It's a, it's a passage I, I started to skip and go on down a few verses later, but I thought, well, we all need to be made to feel uncomfortable in some way this morning by the challenge of Jesus because Jesus did indeed challenge his disciples to come out of, out of uh, our comfort zone. But in chapter 14, verse 12, he said also to the man who invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. Now, 
he's not forbidding you to have fellowship with your friends and families. He's saying you can imply the word only is implied here. Don't just you know have little parties with your friends and your rich friends and your neighbors. But he goes on. He says, but when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the unjust. The idea here I want you to get is, first of all, you ought to be inviting. He tells us to go, and then he tells us to invite. And he tells us to invite, and he gives us a little list here. He tells us to invite people that we might normally not want to hang out with. We ought to get out of our little rich circles and get out of our little people that look just like us and talk just like us and buy just like us and, and include people that don't have what we have been blessed with, health and wealth. But he goes on and tells this wonderful story. I'm going to start with verse 16. But he said to him, Luke 14, But he said to him, A man once gave a, bank, a great banquet and invited many. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come for everything is now ready. But they all like began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servants, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, What have you commanded? Uh, Sir, what you have commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste uh, my banquet. Listen, folks, this is powerful stuff. This is the Great Commission uh, in a parable. That we are the servants in the household. We've been privileged to become a servant in God's house. And we are to go out and we are to invite anybody and everybody to come in to this grand banquet that we are partaking of now and will one day sit down at the, the, the table of, of, of God and spend an eternity in fellowship with Him. We're, we're already experiencing that. We're already tasting that. But we're going to ultimately one day uh, be... Be just so caught up in it. Be, be a part of this eternal banquet. We're, like I say, we've got a foretaste of it, but not yet. Not, not everything that there is for us. But in the meantime, you and I have this opportunity to go out and notice, I'm saying, go and invite people. And to come uh, invite these people to come in. And, and look, there's still more room, and so we go out and we invite more. In other words... We are to seek and to save those that are lost. Now in Luke chapter 15, you know the story. Jesus is being criticized for some of the people that he's hanging out with. He's being criticized by the scribes and the Pharisees. And he begins to uh, 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 tell them little stories to show them the error of their way and the hardness of their heart. <coughs> now, I, I, it's amazing how... The, the second story has captured my attention mainly because it took me a long time to fully appreciate it. But let's, let's run through the first two and then save, save the, the one that we know the most about for the end of the lesson. You'll kind of get excited when I get there because you know I'm coming to an end. In, uh, in the first story, you know, you know this, and I'm not, so I'm not going to read them to you. The first story, you've got a man who has a hundred sheep. One of them goes astray. And he goes out and he looks for it. I, I, you, if you've never had a, a missing animal, 
And you may not be able to fully understand the frustration that is involved in this story. If your life was dependent on, your livelihood was dependent on your, your livestock, you might not be able to understand just how, how powerful this story is. Going out and retrieving lost livestock is usually a pretty hard job. Because lost livestock usually go somewhere hard to get them out. Uh, and, they, and even though you're trying to rescue them, they tend to want to hide from you. And so you have this picture of this shepherd that goes out, and yes, he's got the 99 back home, and he could have count, you know, said, look, i still got plenty. What, what difference does one make? But he goes out there, and he searches, and he finds it. And, and, and I don't know if he throws the thing over his shoulder. I don't know how else you would know. You know, sheep are kind of dumb animals. They're kind of hard to drive, at least one-on-one, -on -one, and they move pretty fast. Maybe the easy thing for him to do is throw it over his shoulder and take it back that way. But he brings it back home, and you have this, this, this picture of rejoicing. And then the one that, like I say, resonates with me so much is the woman... Of the story about the woman that has ten coins and she loses one. And and she just I you know, maybe she's not as, as stressed out as I tend to be, or as anxious, or maybe she's not one of these worry warts like I am. Maybe she's pretty methodical about this and she says, Okay, I'm gonna search the house using a grid. Alright, I'm gonna mark this place off and I'm gonna search this grid. I just, you know, I don't work that way. I go and I just tear everything apart and I look for it. And I probably look in the same spot four or five times. Uh, it's a frustrating thing. Folks, I, as you know, I, I was just recently, I just recently went to Baja. That's where I was last weekend. Well, about a week before that, I, I'm trying to be like a Boy Scout. I'm trying to be prepared. <laughs> and so I start getting things together. And, and the one thing that I can't find is my passport. That's kind of important. <laughs> now, there's really only two or three places that it's going to be. And I, I, I try to remain calm and collected in all of this and not get all agitated and not, not get grumpy and take it out on my wife. And so I... There's, there's three drawers that used to be mine, but Lynn took them over. Uh, but there's a possibility that it was stored in there, and so I find Leanne's, and I find my kids, and I find stuff that I didn't know I was missing, and, and I go through all of this stuff, and it's not there. I go through it the first time, and I say, well, it's not there. Next day I go through it again. Two days later I go through it again. That's a frustrating thing, isn't it? Now I'm not even going to tell you all the other places, my little hiding places, but I look through them two or three times, and after looking through them two or three times, I'm still trying not to panic. But lo and behold, I look, and it just so happens that it's wedged down in between some paper. And I look at it. Now, what's the feeling that I have? And I got to do a better job of not losing this thing. <laughs> this lady looks for this coin, and when she finally finds it, she has, to me, she invites her little friends over, and they have a little party. This is big. This is something to rejoice about. But folks, Jesus is telling these stories because the scribes and the Pharisees have forgotten that they're supposed to be trying to reach lost people. They've forgotten their mission. They, they, have, they consider themselves saved. And, and they consider those that are lost, the, the bad crowd, they consider them as unworthy of their time. And they have forgotten what God really is all about, and that is calling people into His fellowship. And here He is sitting in the middle of tax collectors and sinners being criticized, and, he, and, he, and He's telling these stories. 
That we ought to be seeking and saving the lost. Now why should we be interested in seeking and saving the lost? Well, simple. Because Jesus says that's what we're supposed to do. He said love your enemies. That's hard. He said that you ought to do good. That's hard. You ought to tell the truth. That's, that's hard. But apparently we don't mind those commandments nearly as much as we are bothered by the fact that he says go into all the world and preach the gospel. But it's part of it. Now, another reason that we ought to be willing to seek and save the lost is we ought to feel a sense of obligation. I was asking Melinda the other day. You know, Melinda grew up sort of in the South. She grew up in Russia for a while. But she grew up in the South and she is... Turned her back on southern ways, and that bothers me so bad. And she, she don't want Ryan to sound like me. But anyway, uh, I asked her the other day. I had this phrase on my mind. Uh, it's a wonderful phrase that you, I don't hear. I don't know that I hear it much anymore. You used to hear it all the time. Uh, I asked her, had she ever heard the phrase, much obliged? And she had. Now, I don't know if she will use it because it's kind of a southern thing. Uh, in particular, but anyway, much obliged. Now, let me tell you, young people, what that phrase means. Somebody does something nice for you, you say, much obliged, meaning you recognize they've done something good for you, and you feel a sense of debt to them for what they've done. Now, in this day and age of entitlement, a lot of people are not much obliged. In this day in which people expect things to be handed to them and expect others to do for them, there's not this sense of gratitude, but a person is thinking right, is grateful for any kind action, for any act of grace, for any gift. And when it comes to God and our salvation, we ought to be much obliged. We ought to feel this sense of gratitude and this, and this sense of debt. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1 and verse 14, isn't it? He says, I'm obligated to share the gospel to the Jew and to the Greek, to the wise and the unwise, to the civilized, to the barbarian. In other words, I have this sense of debt. God saved me through Christ, and I need to be sharing that because God wants other people to be saved, and that's part of it. You see, there's something that we need to see in these two stories about the searching for the lost sheep and this searching uh, for the lost coin, and that is this sense of urgency, uh, this sense. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I, I, have, you ever, have you ever lost your child? I mean, probably you won't hold your hand up because now you'll get arrested if you, if you admit that you misplaced your child for a little while. You know, it's, it's amazing, folks. It's amazing when your children are small at, at some of the places that they can take naps. I mean, sometimes they go off in a closet. Sometimes, you know, they're playing and they go to sleep. But here, here's what can happen. You, you listen, and when it gets quiet, that, that should make every parent nervous, right? When your child is playing and it gets quiet, they're either up to something they're not supposed to be, like riding on the wall, or maybe they're asleep or something they could have slipped out. But just imagine your child all of a sudden not being where it's supposed to be. And you notice the front door is open. I used to, that wouldn't really be a problem. But today, that's a problem. You, you, you can't let your child go out and play without you watching them, right? The child, the front door is a little bit open, and, and, and you look through the house, and you make sure, oh, maybe my child has stepped outside, and you look outside, and the child is nowhere. Well, but now there's this sense of panic. Do you call the police? You start calling your neighbors. You're ready to move heaven and earth for your child. Now, you, you, you're, you're going through all of this and you're, and you're working 
the, the, the sense of panic, the sense of fear, is just it's just becoming an overwhelming thing. And you, and you happen to walk down the hallway and you look and, and there's your child snuggled up in the bottom of a closet asleep. The sense of relief is just so overwhelming that, that, that you, 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 you know, your thought is hug your child or wake him up or, or wake her up and spank her for scaring you so much. The feelings are indescribable. Listen, folks, the world, apart from Jesus Christ, is lost. And Jude likens our duty to snatching people out of the fire. This is important. This is not optional. We need to be about the business of seeking and saving the lost. One of the things that I think about is, is in the first two stories is that they were, the searching is diligent, it's intense, it's purposeful. Now here's, here's a prayer that I have for every individual that attends here. That we're purposeful in living our lives to try to reach other people. That we ought to be aware that every day in our life there are opportunities to share with somebody our testimony. To share with somebody some words of counsel from the scripture. Every single day there are opportunities for us to just offer a simple invitation. Every single day. There are, there are things that pop up. And so many times those things pop up and go by and we never once thought this was a grand opportunity for me to possibly reach somebody with the gospel. So it's my prayer that we become more aware of everything that God presents us and every person that God presents us with, that we're aware of what we can do. I don't want to bore you and I'm running out of time. Somehow or another running out of time this morning. In fact, I already passed time, but got to finish out a couple of thoughts. Some of you may be jumping ahead and you're thinking, well, wait a minute, in the story of the prodigal son, the third story in this, this chain of stories, the, they, the father doesn't go and seek the son. Are you listening to me on this, folks? Are you listening to me? The father doesn't go seek the son. The father lets the son go. But I'm going to tell you what you need to notice. And it's something that you can do and be a part of. The Father had provided such a place that anybody thinking logically, sensibly would want to go back to. And so the prodigal son is out here living like an idiot. Living like an idiot. And one day he starts thinking straight and he says, you know, my, the servants in my father's household have it better than I do. I'm going back. And when he goes back, here's what he finds. He finds a father with open arms and an elder brother with a closed heart. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, here's what the church is supposed to be. We're supposed to be a group of people that seek and save the lost, but we're also to be a group of people that have created such an environment that people will want to come back to, and when they come back, we welcome them with open arms. This is something you don't hear come from my mouth very much, but I'm going to read you a poem. At the completion of the Golden Gate, 
No, the angels did not celebrate. And when the Wright brothers flew their bird, no angelic shouts were heard. There's only one thing that we are sure about that can make the angels jump and shout. It's when a sinner makes the Lord his choice. That's when the angels rejoice. When the light bulb first lit up the town, no, the angels did not dance around. And when the Model T first hit the street, it did not bring all of heaven to its feet. When the first man stepped on the moon, they didn't sing a victory tune. And when the first com computer was born, they didn't blow Gabriel's horn. There's only one thing that we're sure about that can make those angels jump and shout. It's when a sinner heeds his Savior's voice. That's when the angels rejoice. Let's do our job, folks. Let's do our job and seek and save the lost. Cause heaven to rejoice and rejoice in our own hearts that somebody has been brought near to God through the blood of Jesus. It may be that you need to respond today and put Christ on in baptism, or it may be that you're a child of God and you've wandered away from God. You need to come back. We invite you to come as we stand and sing together. Yeah.